Oh yeah, it's time for another Greg's Garage Pod with co-host Jason Pridmore. I'm Greg White, and Jason is here. Um, hi, Jason. How are you? Hey, Greg. I'm, I'm, I'm surviving. I, nothing's broken oh, today. That's good, I think. all right. Hey, we made so, it. All right, very good. Man, you don't think I've got every joke from every friend? Well, I thought they were all my friends, but <laughs> it's uh, it's slowly progressing to think that I have a lot of enemies now because um, of the text messages and other things I get. I have to stop being so honest on this podcast, especially about my current health, because it just seems like it just, you know, snowballs. So you didn't break anything on the lower body. You didn't break anything on the upper body. Oh, so far this week, I've been just okay. Heal. Just healing. I've been, right. uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm shocked, low. honestly, and a little disappointed that your Thank friends you. would make fun of you. I mean, really, I don't, I would uh-huh. never, ever. No, 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 Greg, of course. Of course, you would never take the opportunity to take a shot at me, you know, Never. for not being able to walk. Yeah. Right. So, so anyway, so. this is our Moto America warm up podcast. And this week, Jason, round eight of the 2019 championship already. It's coming up at Pittsburgh International Raceway or what they call pit race. I call it pit race now, you know, just north of the Steel City. Um, this is what our second in two weeks as we finish up the year with a race every other weekend. Uh, Jason, Let's first talk a little bit about what we saw at Sonoma Raceway. You ready to jump right into it? I'm ready. Let's do it. Bike. Let's do it. All right. Let's go over the results. All right. So the results for Superbike is we saw a really interesting, I guess you'd call it interesting, a very interesting race. Number one, uh, Garrett Gerloff won his second in a row by 10.3 seconds. You had Matthew Skulls, J.D. Beach, uh, Jake Gagne, your top five, and then Flinders and Verderico. We had Jake Lewis out. Uh, Cam Peterson, Kyle Wyman, David Anthony, Cameron Bobier, Josh Heron, yep. Jeremy Coffey. I mean, we had more DNFs than we did finishers. That was a weird one. Then we went on to race two where Cameron Bobier got back on it, won by 5.2 seconds over Garrett Gerloff, Josh Heron in third, Matthew Skultz, J.D. Beach. Then you had Gagne, Peterson, Anthony, Coffey, Verderico, Jake Lewis in 11th place. Wyman. Yeah, he made it. Flinders, a very uncharacteristic crash by Max Flinders. He was out, but even more so was the early exit of Tony Elias. In the at the end, I guess it was thirty nine points going in, thirty four on the way out. Tony Elias leads Cameron Bobier. We have what Jay six races left in the season. So, what did you see? What are your thoughts? What are you shocked? Well, about? the first race there was the first race was just brutal. I mean, we just don't see that much attrition in our races normally. And, uh, you know, to see all the problems that we had, it kind of started it. I mean, it literally it started even before the race started, Jeremy coffee, couldn't get his bike back together after his incident in qualifying in that morning. Um, so we were missing a guy right off the bat. And then Josh Heron goes down into turn four and he falls, which was a shame. And it took Jake Lewis, like you said, Greg, and it was weird because Jake, didn't kind of come back and get back on where he should have. So he gets black flagged. I I don't think I've ever seen that, to be honest with you, where I've seen guys get black flagged, but Jake just, he should have just turned the bike around and got, you know, back on where he, uh, where he got run off. Um, Yeah. It was just the first race to me was just a bummer because it was just so much attrition. Uh, Championship was shaken up again because really at the end of the day, Saturday, you and I thought, well, that's it. Cameron Bobier just, kind of threw the championship away he fell over in turn four um because he knew he wanted to get to the front had to get to the front uh and he crashed so when we left saturday evening i i don't know if i would i guess i could say i was a little bit deflated because the race there was such a gap between riders and then our championship kind of looked like it was over and i and i felt like i wasn't giving garrett Gerloff enough credit almost because he won another race and i was super pumped for him coming off his win at Laguna. Um, and he rode great. Like Tony didn't have, didn't look like he had anything for Garrett at all. Um, but it just kind of felt like, well, shoot, man. Like I was kind of hoping that the race would go down to the, at least go to Barber. But then it was kind of looking like it was going to get sorted out probably after Jersey, you know, or before Jersey. Um, and then, then, then Sunday happened and it's it just, that's why they run the races, isn't it? I mean, when Tony fell on the second lap, just out of our camera view, just out of our view, we were watching a race, I think, for third and fourth coming into turn seven. But I heard a bike. I heard a bike fall. But then I kind of thought I was hearing something. And then sure enough, our cameras picked it up that Tony had fallen as well. And it was uh, it was it was just crazy. It was a crazy weekend for me looking at it. 
I think the two day event, having a program so accelerated, trying to get all these bikes in and that particular racetrack, Sonoma Raceway, Jason, it, it's technical to begin with. It's a, not an easy track to get a bike set up for if it's smooth, but the track surface is deteriorated to the point where I think it threw a lot of things into the mix. What a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, if you look at a motorcycle suspension and you bounce up on it straight up and down, that's the way it's designed to work. I mean, the way the forks work, the way the shock works. Now you lean the bike over, the suspension still works the same way. It wants to go up and down, but now the bike's leaned over. So it's not like if you're going straight over a surface and it can just absorb all those bumps and the cracks, it's got to do it also leaned over and the tire itself, how much flex there is in the tire helps the suspension work. So it's a hard braking place. It's up and down. So you want to make the suspension stiff, but on the other hand, you've got to make the suspension soft to go over those big bumps. And it takes some time to figure that out. And not everyone had that kind of time. And I think that was part of the reason we saw in race number one, as much attrition as we saw people being forced into mistakes because they knew or felt that they didn't have the bike necessarily to win from behind. You got to be out front. You got to control the pace. The, the Suzuki's knew that. You, Tony talked about it to, with me on Sunday a lot, how he's just got to get out front and try to control the pace of the Yamahas because of, they were rolling so well through that Sonoma Raceway. At a place like that, you'd think. That's kind of why we thought that the Yamahas were going to be so good at Utah. And they were, but Tony was able to do exactly what you just said. He kind of managed the pace and kind of did his thing. You know, and I don't know of the three that we've done so far, and we still have one more coming up in New Jersey. I think that with the accelerated schedule, I like how you said that, with the two-day schedule, um, I think Sonoma is extremely difficult. Because if you do have people, like new people learning the track, I think – is, is a little bit harder there. Um, they're just kind of missing that day. And, 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 and it is, it is definitely harder if you have an incident to maybe get your bike back together. I mean, like in this case, like we saw Jeremy coffee, um, you, you know, he just wasn't able to make the grid because he didn't have enough time to get his bike fixed. Um, I think that, that it definitely makes things a little bit harder and you're right. Sonoma, I rode there two months ago, three months ago, and it has gotten extremely rough. And Sonoma to me is when you look at our calendar, it's of the 10 tracks that we go to, it's in my top four or five. I mean, I, I love the place. I, I just think it's so much fun. Um, but we saw some issues, didn't we? I mean, like if you saw Matthew Skoltz's first accident on Saturday morning, it couldn't have been any more innocent. All the guy did is he ran it up on the curbing and he got to the top part, Greg, of the flat part of the curbing. So he kind of went up the little kind of how it's uh, angled. He went and he got to the top and the thing just spun up and spit him off. It wasn't like, mm. it wasn't like he did anything really wrong. Did you see that first crash? I saw parts of the first crash, but I only and saw just, it like it just, once or twice and didn't have a chance to analyze it. You know, it spit him off and it, it basically, he just lost balance. It spit him so hard that it threw him off the inside of the bike and he was trying to hold on to it because the bike still wanted to go straight, but then it just kind of got augered in and you know, it's just little stuff like that. Like, you know, in no way, am I, am I trying to bust Sonoma raceways, um, tail or anything, but it's definitely due for, you know, it's definitely due for repave and some updates on the curbings and, and this and that for motorcycles. But see, the Um, thing about Sonoma raceway is we know it as Sears mm -hmm. point Infineon, Jason, is that there's so many talented motorcycle riders that have come out of that racetrack. And I think it's because of the very fact that you have so many different elements, you know, the elevation changes and the, how do you manage the bike as it bottoms out over here and hard braking spots going downhill and a lot of time on the edge of the tire. There's so many yep. different things that that track gets thrown at you. And there's always been a debate on like the club racer level as to what region's the best region. And, you know, we've seen mm-hmm. obviously talented riders come out of Texas area, um, you know, like the Kevin Schwantz's or, you know, the, um, Freddie Spencer's of the world. And we've yep. seen a ton of yep. people come out of the Southeast region for sure. And then in California, you know, everybody loves to be like, ah, Willow Springs this and Willow Springs that. But, and there's been some riders that have come out of there, but I think that in California, without question, Sonoma Raceway or that area has produced, I think more, uh, amazing riders. You know yes. what I mean? Like, and I think it, yeah. I think it's because of the characteristics. Like you, if you can go fast there, 
you can go fast at many other places, I guess is the point that yeah, I'm trying to make. Yeah, because it's bumpy and technical and it's got fast, it's got slow, it's got a little bit of everything. I mean, really, it's been Cameron Bovier's stomping grounds. I think that's why when he made the mistake the first day, he was trying to get to the front uh, in turn four, got in there a little bit deep, trail breaking in there. Um, and just, you know, just it was an innocent little crash, took him out of and the you race. you know what Cam said to me, Jake? He said, away. What's like that? you... I'm sure you've been in that situation before where you've had to hold your breath. Like, Oh man, I hope this like, you know, and make a pass cam says it yeah. wasn't like that for him. He was actually really no. confident. He was surprised when he crashed. Yeah, no. And that's, those are the worst kind. Cause you think, Oh, I've got everything under control. And I think that as you mature as a rider, you really, you develop that fine line of, okay, I'm on, I'm in here deep. Do I stand it up just a little bit to make it to, I don't lose the front. And you could tell there was none of that from him. He thought, okay, I got this. I'm going to make it. I'm going to go. <laughs> um, but, but in the back of, in the back of your mind though, when you're in Cameron's case, Greg, I, I think that in the back of your mind, you're thinking to yourself, I got to get it slowed down at the apex of this corner so that Tony doesn't square me up and go back by me. And, you know, um, being able to and, and and look regardless if he thought didn't think that whatever it was there's always going to be that thought of i got to get it in here and i got to get it past him but if i run wide he's going to square it back up like we've seen tony do before and there's a pattern there of how tony races guys and basically cameron was trying to do what tony does to those guys all the time just kind of going right to the apex get the bike stopped get it turned um but he just i mean you hate even saying that he made a mistake because when you don't feel like you're doing anything wrong and then you fall, you go like, whoa, what just happened? You know? Yeah. But, uh, well, no, you know, Garrett yeah, was like, in, I know, but I mean, yeah. And I understand yeah, you theoretically know what, you're what you're saying. Yeah. 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 And you know, Garrett Gerloff was impressive again, uh, for the, you know, the second race, of uh, on, on Sunday, he actually pushed Cameron and he just kept making these little mistakes like turn nine, but that's because of the pace that Cameron was riding and the consistency that he rides at. I love Garrett's comment afterwards of like, Oh yeah. now I remember kind of what second place tastes like, you know? Um, and, and, but I thought he was impressive again. JD beach was one of the few guys to finish both races. He ends up with a fourth and a fifth. And, you know, the second day him and Matthew Skultz and Heron just kind of rode around. Didn't look like it didn't look like JD. It just, maybe had the package under him. And what I mean by that is setup wise, it looked like there was just something missing a little bit setup wise. And, um, you know, going out there and watching the sessions, JD's bike definitely is different on how, what, what he likes compared to some of the other Yamahas just by listening and watching and, and seeing a lot of the lines are the same, but characteristics of the bikes are a little bit different. But, you know, he got a pretty decent championship points haul. I think Heron making a mistake early again in the first race. I mean, it's just frustrating. It's to see a guy as good as he is um, make those little errors. And kind of heard that he thought Garrett checked up a little bit. And it's like, well, it's, it's the first lap. We're four turns into it. You know, you got there's a feel out process, isn't there, Greg, yeah. at the beginning of these races? Yeah. And you got to let it come to you a little bit. Um puts it on the podium the second day i'll be at 20 seconds back but at least he salvaged something from the weekend you know josh heron to me is in a very unique situation where you know you have only four factory seats available and he gets to ride under a one-year contract and it's yeah. like you know he's he's trying to he's already has two races on the season and he's he told me that suzuki is very happy with the fact that he won two races and and he's good, but he still wants to prove that he deserves that ride, that he should get re-signed for this year. And there's that, plus the other side of it is just finish races, you know? So I, I think it's been like this all season for Josh Heron, no fault of his own, that he's just in a very precarious situation yep. with the current climate. And so I think he's doing the best job he can. And when he really just gets it right, then he's there, you know, he's there on the podium. He's obviously won a couple of races and when it goes bad, it just goes bad for him this year. And, and, um, it's weird because I want to say in a way, like I hate it for him, like this type of season he's having, but on the other hand, he's won two races. So, and put it on the yeah, podium again in say? race two. It's like, mm, it's yeah. just kind of one well, of those it was seasons. good to see that he, it, the stats that you bring up are so true because, you know, when we put up our graphic that, here are the podium finishers for the year. And it's like, well, Josh Heron's only got two podiums and they're both wins. And obviously he changed that at Sonoma by getting that third place. But 
but that kind of just shows the inconsistency that he's had mm-hmm. uh, little problems here and there. Um, it seems like some of his tip offs always just happen at the wrong time. Like I remember seeing him tip off at Atlanta, I believe in one of the qualifying sessions at the top of the Hill kind of puts him on his back foot a little bit at round one. Um, it just seems like there's just little things that once he gets that sorted and straightened out, um, you know, I think that that will be, you know, that would be good. He's got three rounds now left to, to try to just, I don't know if you call it reset. I think you set the reset button before Sonoma and he got a podium. I just wish that he could have managed that first race and then seen kind of where he was because it's not just a matter of making the mistake and this and that it's, it's the amount of data and time that you lose by not completing all those, uh, all those laps. I mean, the 22 laps that he didn't get to do on, on, uh, on Saturday, he kind of goes into Sunday with the setup he would have had for Saturday and who knows what he could have changed. So he didn't really get a chance to try to improve his bike. Yeah. Um, and then you got the case of Matthew Skultz who just, he, he tips off really, uh, honestly, I felt bad for him after the first one, after the second one, I saw the second one and uh, I saw him disappear out of my, out of my sight. I knew there was something bad happening, but I, he went, got behind the trees. I went and picked him up and just, he was very remorseful, very sad. And then I think he kind of rode that way in the second race. He did everything he could to try to get on the podium, but I kind of felt like Heron and Skultz were in the same boat. We've just got to finish. I got to see a checkered flag, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the case too. Obviously that's what you need to do. So Jay, looking forward to pit race. What do you think? I mean, you know, Heron won a race last year. The, this, the thing that stands out in my mind the most, I guess, about pit race last year was Garrett Gerloff was as close to the top of the timesheets. He wasn't like at the top at the end of, of the timesheets, but he was like second place almost every single time they went out. And he was really close. Did he lead? He crashed. He didn't finish race number two. And I haven't gone back and looked at it yet, but I know he didn't finish race number two. But I remember Garrett being very fast at pit race. So if you look at that, you know, Josh Heron won a race on a Yamaha last year and Tony, I believe won race number one last year. What do you think? Well, there's nobody better in half wet and half dry conditions than Josh Heron. Like if you remember this race last year, it was a little bit kind of damp. I think when they went out oh, and you remember the lead he pulled the on the first lap, that's right. he yep. just took, I mean, he was amazing. Like that's the thing about Heron that just, it, 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 when you see the guy, when he is on, when he is, it's almost like, it's almost like when he gets those kind of conditions, his focus and his concentration levels go up and he just, I, I mean, I remember watching the first two or three laps of that race, just thinking to myself, he's making everybody look silly. He was just that good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was, wasn't he? Yeah, I he mean, was. do you remember Greg? I mean, yep. and then he just, he checks out, manages the race. I mean, you couldn't have ran a better race than what he ran there. And so he's going to go there with some confidence. I think the weather, I actually looked up the weather. It looks like it's going to be pretty good. Oh, really? Um, mm. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be nice, which is which is not going to be too hot. So it's going to be nice. But I think that, oh man, it, between the three guys that we have been kind of documenting, the Cameron Bovia, Gerloff, and of course, championship leader, Tony uh, Ilias, I think that when you look at those three, it's going to be a big fight up at the front. Um, because Garrett's got a little bit of, you know, he's only 40 points back. And there's still a lot of points up for grabs. So he's not out of this. I mean, you are literally Tony's one mistake away from making this all of a sudden, again, a, a true three rider scrap for the championship. And if Heron gets in there and, and throws his name in that hat as well, as well as Matthew, um, I think that the, yeah, I mean, I think Pittsburgh's going to be really, really good. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and, and hopefully we get a lot of people come out and, Dude, you're, and have a look you're at not it. kidding. I just looked up the weather. 71 degrees yep. and sunny on Friday. Perfect, right? Yep. 75 on Saturday, 78 on Sunday. Doesn't get better. Yeah, maybe a cloud or two in the sky, but beautiful. Oh, yeah. We're it's just going to be we're it's some good be great. racing. Yep. I think, uh, you know, and, and there's guys that we, that, that for me, when I sit there and I look at certain guys out there, I mean, I'm looking at it, even like Cam Peterson, he's actually been riding really well. We haven't really talked about Cam that much. But man, he's been riding so well, Greg. And I think that the Omega uh, Motorsports team he rides for, they're they're continuing to get that bike better. We just don't – it's kind of nice in a way. We don't hear a lot of things about what's going on there. Um, well, at least I don't. I know you talk to those guys quite a bit more because you're in the pits a lot more um, when yeah. I'm out watching the sessions. Yeah, I 
The thing but it's about, like they're just chipping away at it, aren't they? They are, but they have a lot of little problems. Like those little problems that you have as a team that's like this wire shorts this thing out or this transmit. You know what I mean? It's like these little tiny things. And I haven't gone back and looked at it, and I don't even know how I would get it. But Cam Peterson probably has done the least amount of laps of anybody in the class all year long. And so when I look at it from that standpoint and how much time he's had on the bike and how quick he's able to go, Every time he rides, I'm really impressed with him, you know, because yeah. he's not putting it on the deck. It's just no. the bike stops, you know, it stops working or they get three laps in practice and the team is just, uh, they're working so hard. I mean, so yeah. hard to get this thing going. And it's just one of those programs this year as you get things sorted out where you just have these little itty bitty problems, kind of like say something that we saw last year with like David Anthony on the fly racing bike, you know, it's, it, it yeah. was like. He just had all this stuff going on last year and he just had these little bit of problems and he was trying to get the most out of his uh, Kawasaki ZX-10. And, you know, it was blowing up and doing things. And so this year he goes, okay, let me let me just simplify this process a little bit. Let me take a little bit of horsepower out of this bike to make sure it lasts. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's been able to ride. And when David Anthony's able to ride, we end a session, dude's P4 or whatever. And you're like, oh, there he is. You know, yep. what I mean? like it's exactly right. It's those. Types I think that's going to be like that with Cam too. I mean, that's we've seen I'm this thinking, kid come yeah. back from so many things. Or you know, I mean, he retired at one point, didn't he? For like what a weekend. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. so you know, the thing is with I I I think he's great. Um, I like Cameron. I, I just like Cameron Peterson a lot. I think he's a good kid. But I love the fact that we don't hear a lot of dramas coming out of that team, and they're just grinding and they're working, and it seems like things are going okay. And and positive so let's just hope that they keep going in super sport greg you know moving on when we start talking about super sport um going through the first you know looking at the looking at the results first and foremost but when i start looking at them i'll explain to you the thing i pulled away from it but we got hayden gillum winning the first day barely over bobby fong by a tenth of a second then we have pj jacobs in third bryce prince and josh hayes rounded out the top five uh when you look at race two you had those same five guys again, but it was mixed up. Now we had PJ winning, Bobby Fong second, Bryce Prince finishes third, Hayden Gillum fourth, and Josh Hayes fifth once again. You know, when I looked at it and I start thinking about it for this for this podcast that we do, uh, the guy who has just impressed me so much is Bobby Fong, and it's really easy for me to say that because he's leading the points. But more than that, I've just seen this this maturity come from Bobby this year, where it's like. I'm going to take what I can get. I'm going to ride hard. He doesn't really look like he's influenced by others too much. He's just out there grinding and doing the laps and doing the things he needs to do. He finishes second the first day by a tenth. And the second day, yeah, PJ just dominated the second day. I think that would be the biggest thing that I would take from the weekend is the domination of the Celtic HSBK racing team and rider. But Bobby just grinds out those laps, gets two second place finishes, uh, increases his points lead. And, um, you know, with three rounds to go, I, I, it's going to take something special to beat him right now because he's just always in that top three. Beat him for the championship, you mean? That's what I mean. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, I would agree with you 100% on that one because I think with PJ, Bobby Fong, and obviously, you know, Hayden Gillum in the mix, for me, each, each race we go to is a bit of a toss-up because any one of those riders or all three of them can show up with a bunch of speed. But mm-hmm. yeah, if Bobby keeps his nose clean which he really seems like he's doing a great job of and it it's it seems like this year like part of the maturity that i see from bobby and i don't know i don't know if it's if it's crew chief frank aragaki who's really kind of working with bobby on this or not but when bobby gets beat it doesn't seem to beat him down anymore you know like Mm -hmm. i think if you look at the beginning of the season he goes out and it was like blammo he has a great weekend at road atlanta then the next weekend at bir it was like total disaster right like it was fell off and you know he stumbled around and is he going to get back in the race and you know the whole drama that surrounded that and I thought well there it is it's going to go off the rails or will it will it will it or won't it you know and man you want to talk about he the VIR is like nothing it's like dust in the wind at this point for Bobby and it's all looking forward and you know I don't know if it's team structure you know he talked about on this podcast the beginning of the year how many years he was trying to get up with the M4 next star Suzuki team. And now he's in the mix and he's got it. And like I said, the job I've said it on the broadcast, Jay, you know, had the job at the beginning of the year and now he doesn't. Yep. So, you know, that's another thing being able, I would imagine being able to race full time and keep your focus on that and not have to worry about, Oh, I've got a report due or I've got to return emails or like all the things that come with a job. 
but he's, he's able a to racer. keep focused yeah. on it. Yeah, he's, he's a full-time yeah. racer, as he's, is PJ, as yep. is Hayden, right? The guys he's going up against. Yeah, so. That's right. And it's just a matter now of him. Like It just feels like everything's kind of fallen in place. And I think that, you know, Hayden Gillum, who we just kind of thought, I thought Hayden would have, would have seven wins by now and he'd be, you know, it kind of, I'm not going to say dominating the championship, but he was kind of my pick at the beginning of the year, uh, just from what I saw last year. And for whatever reason, I mean, obviously he shows what he's capable of again the first day. And then the, you know, when you look at the second day, uh, you know, all of a sudden he finds himself 11 seconds back of these guys. And, and it just doesn't seem real to me. I just feel like uh, maybe they made a setup change overnight. Didn't quite work for him. Uh, ends up fourth. Bryce Prince, just a tremendous job for Bryce on the tuned racing bike, getting himself into third. We've seen Bryce do well at some of these final rounds before. I mean, we're going to Pittsburgh, a track where Bryce Prince really uh, did well last year as well. Um, and so when you when you look at it, I, I kind of felt like Hayden just didn't have anything for those guys the second day. He had nothing. First day, he just kept pushing the fact and and, and if you watch the line difference between Hayden and Bobby, that's what made that race so intriguing for me as a guy calling the race and looking at it and studying both guys. They were both doing lap times within, within a tenth of each other, but they were both doing it a little different way, which I loved. Um, and Hayden looked so good doing it. And the second day, you know, first day, Greg, he, he, you know, he went 38-6. Uh, second day, he went 39-2, which tells me maybe there was a small change that they made to the bike that wasn't quite conducive to to – to Hayden. So, um, it was, well, interesting. I, kinda t- I told yeah. you I had spoken with him before the first race uh-huh. uh, and he just wasn't like really stoked on the bike and he wasn't any happier after the race either. Yeah. You know, and he, and he said, yeah. uh, he told me after the first race and he, he kind of apologized. We were just having a one-on-one conversation, but he kind of apologized to Bobby Fong because after the race, Hayden Gillum race one kept saying like, oh, that was the worst race I've ever run. Oh, this is the worst race I've ever run. Like my head wasn't in it. And and poor Bobby finished his second place. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was yeah. kind of one of those things. But and so I guess Bobby, you know, might have gotten a little bit upset about it. And Hayden was worried about that. But I don't think there's any question. He wasn't happy with the bike. He wins it by a tenth of a second. And I think that they had to go in there and try something again. Accelerated schedule. Not as much time as we normally have. And Jason, you know, in looking at that ex- accelerated schedule, it, it doesn't matter what class we're in. I remember back in 1997 when you won the the 750 Super Sport Championship a couple of times. It seemed, I think, more times than it actually was where you weren't the fastest guy out there. And then you had a guy working with you in the last session, you know, Carl Steyer. In the last session, all of a sudden, he would just go, ah, make a couple changes, then boom, you're gone. Yeah. So the question is, how important can that very last session be, you know, or having that extra time? Because if you think about some of the races you had in 97 or even 98, if you go back there and you go, well, okay, if I didn't have that last session or if Carl didn't go out and look and figure this one thing out at the last minute, I, it might have been a bigger struggle for me to win. Or, And so I think that these accelerated schedules don't give you that opportunity necessarily. Is that a fair thing to say you think yeah it's fair i think the amount of time that they've had on that bike um the ridiculous crew and they've just been that whole team has done such a great job putting a bike underneath underneath hayden for the last couple years you know every now and then it could just be just a little something that you're just not got the feel of as a rider that you just cannot get the bike to do this or do that and that little tiny bit of feel through no fault of a team or a rider is just it's not even a communication breakdown. It's it's sometimes you don't even know what it is that you can't feel, but it's just there. And you, you you might go a direction where you change something to try to get that feel and it makes something so much worse. You go, okay, let's go back to what we had. And then you go the other direction with it. And it's like, no, let's just go back to what we had. And and you're trying to figure that out. And it can, you know, it can be difficult. You looked in the morning, in the morning warm up session, um, Hayden Gillen went 38 two, which is, incredibly fast when you think that in the race he went 39 to um so it could have even been a track condition thing whereas the track heated up that feel that he had in the morning when it was a little bit cooler uh you know maybe because because these guys went quicker in warm-up on sunday morning than they did in the race so it could be heat generated uh as far as like um the track temperatures and things like that it it's hard to it's hard to put your finger on it and i didn't and i don't know why i didn't even think about this but Hayden wanting to apologize about, 
you know, saying the things he said, I, it's not even on my radar. Like he was being honest with us on his TV interview saying, man, I really, yeah, and again, it was just like a one-on-one. Yeah. Which me. is you know great. I, mean? I love that. Like, oh, I man. love that, that he's yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. I love that. He's like that. I mean, I think it's, in, yeah. I think it's great, but, but he's gotta be, but he felt like he had to be honest about it and he just didn't feel great on the bike. He felt as we saw, yeah. right. He made some mistakes at the very end of the race and that allowed Bobby to get to within striking distance. And Hayden admitted he did that, Five laps to go. It just he he got tight. He got really tight, and I was like, "Yeah, you could see it because remember he jumped that curb on the on the second to last lap. He jumped that curb, couldn't get back in the first right hander in the S's yes. to get back to the, and that was it. He, he, as he whipped it back to the left, he was so out of rhythm, and Bobby just went and yep. what three tenths? Yep, just like just that. like that. That was crazy. No, you're hundred yeah. percent right, and it's but yeah, yeah. I, can, I listen. I, I I can't let this podcast go without talking about Josh Hayes in race one and the incident that, you know, created obviously a Sean Dillon Kelly, uh, a crash and, and, you know, stitches in his chin and stuff like that with Sean Dillon Kelly coming from, you know, a, a dead last getting sixth place, <laughs> yeah. yeah, dead last coming to sixth place. I just, I mean, Josh has been a good friend of ours forever. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been friends with Josh for 20 something years, but admittedly he looked a little bit uh, urgent. I guess in race number one, <laughs> urgent, I like a little, that, little yeah. hectic, a little, yeah, he looked urgent. urgent. So yeah. I mean, what's your take on that? I mean, I'm not asking you to slam the, the guy, but you know what I mean? Uh, like, Josh wouldn't I care if I slammed him anyway. He wouldn't care. I don't think, you know, yeah, look, Josh has got a bad start. Didn't he Greg? I mean, he just did. He got shuffled back and he feels like he has the pace to, to still run with guys. And, uh, you know, it, call it an error of judgment that was just gone wrong. Um, he put himself, Josh likes to make things happen on the first lap or two. He feels like that's his biggest opportunity to try to go forward. He's on new tires. He's on this. He he has a way of a race philosophy that I love that was very successful. In this particular case, he went for a spot that wasn't really there and you could see he didn't want to tip the bike and he couldn't tip the bike. And so he uprights the bike and makes a little bit of contact with, with, with um, SDK as they go into the carousel and pushes him off the track and wide. And boy, it, it, it sure did. It, you know, we always talk about rider runoff and safety and this and that. The glaring effects of being pushed off in the carousel and the speed that you're going uh, sure does tell when you hit that dirt because there was no way um, SDK could get the bike slowed down before you hit that tire barrier. And and I think that looking back, I heard Josh was very remorseful. I haven't even talked to him about it. I know Josh so well. He'd be like, eh, you know. Oh, yeah. He was. I mean, yeah, he, oh, was, yeah. he was not. I could see him. I, yeah. I I could just see what he would be like even when the race got red flagged. I guarantee you his number one concern was for SDK. I'm sure Josh. It was when they wheeled him back. I, that's all the reports I got. He was concerned. That's all. He was like shaken. Yep. And that's Josh. That's, you know, that's that's why he is who he is. Um, at the end of the day, it's racing. And these, look, dude, the thing is, it's so weird because every single race weekend around the world, we've been saying this now all year. There's contact being made. And why is that? It's because of the nature of the racing these days is so close. And that's not giving anybody the, the okay, it's okay to push somebody off the track or run into people. That's not saying that. I'm saying that nobody goes into a race trying to hit somebody. Nobody goes into a race trying to put themselves in gray areas. But it does happen in racing. It just does. And a kid who has literally, I cannot say that I've seen him really put a wheel wrong all, all year long, Sean Dillon Kelly, he was just, he was the victim this time. He got kind of pushed off the track going into the carousel and by a four-time Superbike champion that, that felt remorseful and doing it. you know it. what, Jason? You can't take it back. You know what? No, and I never not heard one word. And I was there when he came back from the hospital. It was like eight o'clock at night, still at the track. He came back. Not a word yep. about Josh Hayes. Not a word. Yep. Just, hey, you know what I mean? I'm just glad that I got to the tire wall. I thought I was going to make it to the air fence. I'm worried about the bike. Yep. These guys working. I mean, you know, even all, you know, I don't know if he was on some painkillers or whatever, or if he was just happy to be back at the track, but I was constantly, I'm constantly impressed by his maturity and the ride that he put on was great. Yeah. You know, no, and, guy and comes the last time that he was doing was competitive. The guy gets yeah. to six in the second race, like you said, after coming from dead last. And if you listen to his interview. Sixth, I think, 25th, yeah. Yeah, if you listen to his interview on the grid, he was just happy and and he's just, yeah, he's a breath of fresh air, that guy. And and I think that, that I, I just, I refuse to believe now that he's 17. It just doesn't make sense to me. He's just so beyond his years. And 
man, these guys are going to be in a lot of trouble next year because this kid's going to these tracks he's never seen before. And think about it, Greg. He finished sixth after the second race, and he didn't get to do any of his laps on the first day either. And and he ends up going 39-4 uh, was his quickest lap. And that's that's coming through traffic. It's coming that's through traffic, people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, he, you know, basically he finishes seven seconds off the podium. And if you go back and you look at the race sh- spreadsheets, be really interesting tell of how much time he lost to Bryce Prince. And let's just say the first five laps trying to come through all those people at that place. I I'm, I'm going to dare say that it was definitely more than seven seconds or around seven seconds that he lost, um, in those first however many laps, this guy would have been a true podium contender the second day. Had that not happened, a couple other shout outs I think that we got to look at. Jason Aguilar ends up sixth and seventh. Um, how about Corey Ventura? He, I know it's a home race for him and all that stuff, but great to see Corey Ventura, um, former uh, Liqui Molly kid, uh, gets two top 10 finishes. He ends up 10th in race one, he ends up ninth in race two. Um, definitely doing a great job. And I, and I, again, I have to break out, you know, Lucas Silva, a guy that we don't get to talk about enough quietly on that Altus Motorsports team, just racks up another solid two top 10 finishes, ninth the first day, 10th uh, the second. Um, and and it's great to see some of these guys continuing to improve and get better. And I think 600 at, uh, we got a lot of entries, ton of entries at uh, Pittsburgh this weekend. So 600 is going to be really good. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's look forward to Pittsburgh. What are you thinking? Yeah. I mean, I know PJ's been there, right? Like as like testing, I think that was the first track they went to test the Celtic HSBK racing bike months ago, right? He's kind of the guy, Greg, right now that when you start thinking about where this championship is and you kind of start to, you know, when you look at it, it it has become, you know, a bit of a three horse race. Um, but yeah, because he's 30, PJ's 36 points back. He's yep. not out of it by any stretch because they right. have, still have six raised, what, 150 points to score. Correct. And I think that at this point, and it was a real shame, and we didn't even mention him, but see Richie Escalante fall out of a podium. We haven't seen him make any mistakes this year. And he had a pretty good podium, pretty solid podium, I think, uh, at Sonoma going, and he tipped off. And that really hurt him in the points because he's been so consistent and up front, but he only scored four points in that second race. So it really is kind of a three-horse race right now. 36 points separates the top three, and we're going to three tracks that PJ knows now. Like when I say he knows, Pittsburgh is a track that he has been to. It's not a track that he's uh, uh, been able to race um, a lot, obviously, but it's a, one that he's done a little bit of practice or, or testing or at least seen the place. And with the rejuvenated confidence that that team has, I mean, he won that second race by eight seconds. And that's a big. That's a pretty big gap in Supersport. And Oh, yeah. And and he knows that Hayden's trying to go to the front. So on any given weekend, if PJ wins, he, you know it could be Bobby Hayden, it could be Escalante, you could you know maybe Sean Dylan Kelly gets in there. There there's still room to make up a ton of time in these in this championship. So uh, you know PJ, I think I think you're I think you're right. I think he's going to be a, he's going to be a tough guy to 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 handle these last few rounds if he continues on the trend that he's on. Yeah, and. It'll also depend on Bobby's mindset. I think, you know, is it championship mode time? He doesn't have that much of an advantage. So it's 20 points, but is, you know, so do you, do you keep being aggressive and risk zero points or do you just go, okay, let's see what we have. So that'll be interesting to see how that all unfolds. I I just, I just feel like, I feel like Bobby though, like to your point, Greg, I feel like Bobby is just in a very good spot mentally. I, I don't even look at him in that regard anymore. So yeah, you're right. Yep. Yeah, I mean, for me, for me, no, for me, the way it feels is yeah. that Bobby's in control of this championship. I agree because, with you, hundred percent. Yeah, yep. yeah. Where you have now Hayden and PJ chasing, and it's you know, it's that okay, what's going to happen? But it just feels like Bobby, even though he's only twenty points, if you look at one hundred and fifty versus twenty. But it, yeah, it feels definitely all right. So let's move on to Lickamali Junior Cup then, Jay. Uh, the results are. Hold on, everybody. This is unbelievable. You 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 really won't believe it. <laughs> this kid Rocco Landers won another couple of races. Did the double. Uh, in race number one, he won by 1.5 over Kevin Almeida, and then another uh, one point or right there was Mark Edwards and Josh Cernay. That was a great race. Um, and then Rocco and Kevin Almeida decided Almeida decided to go after each other, and it was two tenths of a second at the end, and they were 19.4 a clear of Mark Edwards on that one. In the points, you have Rocco Landers checking out Jason. He's now got 76 over Dallas Daniels. Because Dallas Daniels wasn't there, 
Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And we're also, when we kind of get wrapped this segment up, uh, Junior Cup up, Jason, we'll talk about all the news surrounding Lickamalee Junior Cup because there's riders bouncing everywhere. But let's get back to Sonoma Raceway and talk about what you saw. Well, Rocco, the first day, you know, he didn't get, uh, again, because we had a two-day schedule, the first session out, he didn't get that many laps. He uh, They had a problem, and so he got to do qualifying. He was on the front row. Um, I think he qualified third. And from that point on, uh, and during the race, he kind of – it's the first time we've seen him really make any mistakes. I mean, he was very lucky not to crash out of turn 11 on that opening lap. Um, so he was very lucky there because the bike kind of high-sided him a little bit, but he got it back underneath him. Um, I think the fact that that Rocco won both races, doing it a little bit differently both times was credit to him. But this Kevin Almeida kid's the real deal. Like Kevin is a couple little things away from from – I, he just needs a little bit of polishing. I think that's the biggest thing I took away from the weekend because he finished one and a half seconds back, as did Mark Edwards, one and a half seconds back. The the battle for second was incredible. Rocco kind of got to the front. It looked like he was just going to split, didn't it, Greg? But then he didn't. Those guys just kind of kept him honest. And on the second day, he had a, a like he had a true battle the second day with Almeido. And I think that as Kevin matures as a rider, what is he? Is he 18, Greg? I'm putting you on the spot. I realize, but I think Almeida's 18. I think he is. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, the second day they finished two tenths off, but the thing that was the teller was the first day, 47.8 was the quickest lap of the week, uh, was the quickest lap of the race. 47, eight, 47, seven actually for Josh Renee. So when you look at the lap times, it was basically the high 47s. The second day, the two guys at the front couldn't, nobody could even get near him. 46 1 for Almeido and 46 3 for Rocco. They improved their race pace, Greg, by just under two seconds 1, 1.7, 1.6 seconds. That's a big difference. That's, that's track a big knowledge. one. Yeah, that's a big yeah. one, right? But it's um, a big one for race, too, because normally we see a huge chunk faster in qualifying in race one and then a smaller advantage in race two, if any. Yep. So yeah, that's a really big, big one. Mm-hmm. And it was a great race at the front. And, uh, you know, I think that those two guys definitely are, are, are the guys, um, now for the rest of the year, uh, Rocco is leaving this place with a, with a huge championship lead. And I think we'll get into that here in a minute when we start talking about some riders swapping around and, and kind of how one domino created an effect for the rest of the paddock in this class. Um, but he's got a really big points lead and this is a team and a dad and a, and a kid who have put all of their money as much as they possibly can into being able to go racing as do a lot of these families. I mean, every you go through the paddock and every family is kind of doing the same thing. They're all doing whatever they can to help the kids get to where they need to be. But this is a kid that's won nearly all of our races this year. Uh, He's breaking lap records all over California. He races every weekend. Um, They're doing everything they can to keep him sharp. They've got plans on him, maybe going over to try out for the Red Bull rookies as Rocco Landers. Uh, he needed these two wins. You heard him thanking some sponsors on his, on the podium. This is the class that we're hoping is going to generate maybe our next world champion. And, and the thing, the thing is, is that he needed these two wins and he got pushed all the way to the end by, by Kevin Almeida. How many different ways has Rocco won? And I think that's really, that's the thing to me, Jason, that shows the true grit of a champion. It's not, Go out, check out, and win every race. We've seen championships like that, haven't we? We've seen riders so dominant, they've never been challenged during the course of the year. And I don't ever want to take anything away from anyone like that. There are just some years where the motorcycle, the rules, the rider, the tires, everything, the crew, perfect. And boom, check out. But Rocco has had his challenges, and he's answered the call. I mean, in almost every single race. I mean, he's only been off the podium one time all yeah. year once yeah and every time he's been on well he's been second place one time okay so he's been yep. off the podium race number two vir we know that crazy conditions we'll yep. go i go wet dry tires that whole situation which was awesomely won by cameron jones on a honda but since then it's been nothing but race wins and one second place finish and i don't care where you are it's it's impressive to me yeah, I mean, you got you got to win your class, and he's fourteen. That's the thing that's and he's fourteen, and you know, and I talk, I've I've talked, I've gotten to know Stony his dad fairly well this year. I Stony and I obviously we, we shared the paddock for a number of years, never really ran into each other, never really spoke to each other. Stony was with Dunlop changing tires. In fact, he made that joke to me that 
you know, Jason, back in the day, I was probably changing your tires and, um, it, I, like when I love, you won championships. Yeah. I love, yeah, I love, I love talking to Sony though. Like he's, he's a good guy and he's got perspective on, on where racing in America is and where racing in the world is now, as far as the costs and the things that go along with it. And this is a guy that has dedicated everything, him and his wife, they traveled around the, you know, the world, Spain, Italy, and things like that to try to give Rocco every advantage that he could. And at 14, it really shows. I think that when you say to me, when you say to me, Jason, how many ways have we seen this kid win? I think it's a credit to the bond that the family has as far as taking that kid all over the world at 14. And that's kind of why Sean Dylan Kelly is the way he is at 17, isn't it, Greg? I mean, he whole Red family Bull, sacrificed every, mm-hmm. everybody sac and, 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 understand i'm not singling out these two kids that they're just they're so beyond their years and rocco really is but the difference is is that when you hang out with rocco and you see sean dylan kelly rocco's 14 he's a kid and i love that about him his personality he's fun um he's engaging he's very uh energetic uh there's he's he's enjoying his racing he's enjoying his time um and he's been really good to watch so first junior cup kid that's given me a nickname i can tell you that much yeah, what is he? Uh, wait, don't tell me because he did. Uh, Grego, no, Grego, Grego, Grego. Calls you Grego. Grego. I love that. Great. That's great. I'm hey, like, it's what's not- up, Rocco? He's like, what's up, Grego? Grego. So but then great. he goes, but then Jason, like when he said it the first time, I was like, oh, that was good. He goes, hey, I'm really sorry. Like, is it okay if I, I was like, dude, that you're, now you're ruining it. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's yeah, how he is. Though, nice. you know? Just go after it. You know, just yeah, go no, after. He's it. great. Yeah, he's, he's funny. He is he's a lot of fun. Kid. He's a lot of fun. And uh, hoping that those guys, obviously now, you know, with some things that have changed in the championship, hopefully we can continue to see Rocco at these last three rounds. Um, uh, because I know, I, I know financially things are tight and, but it is, if it is for a lot of people, um, but, but anyways, let's hope that he continues to go forward. Mark Edwards, let's give a shout out to him. Greg ends up on the yeah. podium in both races. Yeah. Mark Edwards finishes third, the first day, uh, going a minute 47.9. The second day was a little bit slower cause he was in, he was in a big battle there for third. Uh, we saw Brendan Kettleson ride amazing at this round as well. He ends up with a fifth, the first day and a fourth, the second day battling Mark all the way to the line. Good to see Hunter Dunham up there. I think Hunter's just a little bit too big for the class. He's Big tall kid, tall, yeah. Um, and and uh, and yeah. So he ends up fourth. Gage Reese was up there. How about Jacob Stroud? That's somebody who I definitely want to talk to because I got to. His dad was actually a teammate of mine. Andrew Stroud was a teammate of mine at a uh, at a couple of World Endurance races. We saw Andrew over here for a bunch of years. Um, they race Aryan race- racing. I remember yeah, racing. Yeah, against him, meaning I was on the track the same time he was uh, during Formula Extreme races and things like that. Yeah, you say that about a lot of guys, huh? Yeah, I was, I was, I was. You were on around. the track with a lot of different guys. I was poking around for a while. Uh huh. Yeah, I was. <laughs> hey, you found your calling now. Now you're Robin Hood with that little bow and arrow, and like you found your calling. It's a little bit slower pace for you. It seems like it's working out, which is good. <laughs> ah, you know? Good one. That's uh, you like good. that? You like yeah, that? Yeah, that's clever. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Dumb so, but Greg, let's talk a little bit about some off track stuff with this liquid Molly. You know, when we got up there, we kept, we, we, we both found out that Dallas Daniels wasn't going to be there. And the way it was put to me, and you might know a little bit more about it was, is that Dallas was kind of planning over on, on, on coming over and practicing and qualifying Saturday morning for the race uh, at Sonoma, but he wasn't going to do the Saturday afternoon race because it conflicted with the Sacramento mile. Am I correct so far? Yeah, correct so far, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so <laughs> essentially, um, the quarterly racing on track development team kind of gave him walking papers because they kind of felt like, well, listen, if it's not important enough for you to be second in the championship and and you to be here riding for us and, and you're, you have other obligations or commitments to go ride for the Sacramento Mile, then we're not going to need your services anymore. That's kind of how I looked at it. That's more or less the way it ended up unfolding. You know, they eventually came out with the press release a couple of days ago that just kind of fluffed it up. But yeah, that's that's how it is. Well, you know? I mean, oh, I, we, we didn't could, we, we didn't fire him is what I heard. Like we didn't fire him. I'm like, well, okay. I mean, you could say you split amicably, but there, you know, at the end of the day, there was a decision to be made by Dallas Daniels because Sacramento Mile was a fill in race. It was right up the street. I mean, it was the perfect situation, but he had to miss one or the other. And I haven't talked to him about it. And he made the decision. Team made their decision. So next thing you know. There's an available motorcycle. Yeah, but right? but here's the thing. I I what I get frustrated with is is like like I, I realize we're in, we're in this like big politically correct world, but just call it what it is. I mean, it is what it is. Like, hey, if if 
I love Dallas Daniels. I think Dallas Daniels is a tremendous kid, a tremendous writer. But if there's an opportunity that he sees that's bigger for him to do something else or go race somewhere else on that, in this particular case, I'm bummed that he's not that he didn't race on Saturday or that you know that he didn't do it. But we've got more news about him. But but and I and I actually love the quarterly racing on track development team. You know why? Because these guys are committed. They're 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 putting bikes on the grid for us. They're they're making teams. Uh, they're making a place for riders to come and ride and. Yeah. I like both. I, I I don't I and this is just a business decision. It sounds like on both sides that are it's just the way it worked out. I I'm not going to say that one was right, one was wrong. Uh, I no, think there's that, no doubt, and it's a blip right? on the radar. I think for both, right? Yeah, it's because at the end of the day, we're going to see what Dallas Daniels has talent wise, on track development, quarterly racing team is going to go on. You know, it's just Correct. it's a little blip. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, and, and we're going to see it. Um, I mean, I mean, look, when 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 one door closes, other opportunities open. So now, um, it sounds like Damian Jagalov is going to the quarterly race and development team, which is great. And it looks like Dallas has got an opportunity to jump on with the HSBK team uh, in um, uh, at at Pittsburgh on R three, which will be really interesting to see what Dallas thinks of that bike and how it works. Uh, and I Dallas rate, is and Dallas is coming off his first American flat track race win too. Last unreal. Weekend. Like, yeah. So when you really sit there and you look at it, did he make the wrong decision? I don't think he did. Did, did quarterly uh, racing make the wrong decision? I don't think they did. I think if I'm spending the money on somebody to come and race all year, and then they kind of tell me, eh, I'm going to go do the Sacramento mile instead. Yeah. It might make me a little sour. It might make me bummed out a little bit and make me feel like somebody's not as committed as I am to them. So so I'm going to move on and, and both sides have, and I wish them both like nothing but the best, but like, let's call it what it is. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. Absolutely. So, and then also we've read that, that uh, it looks like Dominic Doyle is going to take over the spot that, that Jagalov leaves with, uh, with the Bartcom racing team. Oh, is that so, right? So, mm-hmm. yep. So he is going to go, you know, this is a 17 year old kid that's been driving his van around the country. I mean, 17, At 17. Yeah. Can't even vote. I mean, can't even vote yet, but yet you can drive your van all around the country. And I've gotten to know him a fair bit. Uh, his mom, Anita, sweetheart, she's great. Um, I mean, I, look, it, again, it, all this does is it, it kind of started a little skittle effect of what what are we going to see now moving forward? Who's going to go where? What's going to happen? And it allowed that to 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 move around a little bit, which I like. Nothing and I like think that, a little mid-season drama, Jason. Yeah. A little mid-season but it happens drama. all over. It happen, Look, it happens oh, yeah, in every course. series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just love, I love, and I didn't see the press release this week, but I love the press releases that all these teams put out about certain things. I mean, you, you, you know, I mean, can you imagine the, the, the nightmare that the PR person from KTM must have been trying to do to put a positive <laughs> spin on Johan Zarco leaving their team? I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it, look, at the end of the day, this stuff happens. People move around. It's okay. Everybody finds their way. But now you've got a couple of kids. Jagalov obviously needed a team change. We expected him to be a lot further up than he was, and he's not for whatever reason. And we're going to see Dominic Doyle take that spot, and we're going to see Jigalov go over to quarterly racing. I think it's it works out for all parties. The, the idea that this championship is over, it is pretty much over, isn't it, G Dub? I mean, the points gap is huge. Oh yeah, Rocco's yeah, yeah. been tremendous. Take nothing away from him; he has no. been the standout. Rocco could not start three races at this point. Amazing. You know what I mean, so yes, yes, there's an opportunity. Yes, at seventy six, there's one hundred and fifty. So mathematically, yeah, we're not handing him the number one plate yet, but it's getting closer and closer. Also, want to add to Jason that uh, Cody Wyman, who's one of the racing Wymans, you know Travis, and you know the other yep. guy who's married to our pit reporter. He's yep. actually going to be on a Westby Racing Yamaha R3. He's 25 years old, so this will be the last year for Cody Wyman. So that's a deal where... It's great. Yeah, Chuck Chicotto, actually, who's like the, the manager, team manager for that, he actually owns the bike and all the yep. body work's painted and all that kind of stuff. And he basically just, I don't know, pushed a pile of motorcycle and parts over. And so it's actually going to be Cody running his own program, but you're going to see the Westby name attached to it because Cody's so grateful that he's gotten the opportunity to do it. And Chuck was basically like, look here, look, the, the bike's available. Do what, do whatever you want with it. It's fine. You know, crash it, do whatever. And so he just gave him everything. So it's awesome. You know, so. so let's just kind of look at those guys, at the Westby team. I mean, the thing, the thing that's great about them is it's just, they're, they're just such enthusiasts. Like they want to see it. They want to see 
the grids get bigger. They want to see the grids get bigger and better, obviously. Um, but the fact that that Chuck does that, I think is, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's neat that that we're going to get to see, uh, you know, Cody go out there and 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 write, race it up with these guys. On the last note with this G Dub, I think when you look at it, this is legitimately this weekend. Rocco's first chance to clinch this championship 76 point lead. If he leaves there with what 101 points, the championship's over Mm -hmm. right now. He's got 97 on Almedo and he's got 76 on Dallas. So it'll be really to see how quick Dallas can get up to speed on this, uh, on this R three this weekend. And, uh, yeah, we'll 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 see where that ends up. Oh, hold on, Jay. One um, one one, th- one more yeah. thing I want to say yep. uh, that'll be interesting yep. this weekend. Um, that I hear that Dallas Daniels will be on this. So there are some electronics that are available. It's called a JRC system that's available in World Super Sport 300. That is now a tech bulletin came out a couple of days ago from Moto America saying that this system is available now. So the system, it's got some restrictions or whatever. And I'll try to take some photos and show people of it, but it's a whole dashboard. It's a whole thing where you can, you actually can tool around with some maps. You can have a couple of different maps. There are some limitations on it, but it's going to be interesting because it's, the thought is, is that this electronics package that's available now in, you know, in, in that series in world super sport uh, is part of the reason why we see the R- Yamaha R3 competitive versus the Kawasaki. So I don't know who else is going to get it, but it's kind of like one of those things that they're giving a go. And I've seen it up close. They had it on a bike ready to go at Laguna and um, Scott Smart, who, you know, works Moto America, BSB and all that kind of stuff. He took me through the whole system and showed me everything. And it's, it's a really impressive system. So that's um, great. Yeah. We'll see Dallas on that stuff is from, from what I hear. And moving forward, that's going to just help our series. Obviously, we want to. We don't want. We don't want this to be a Kawasaki Cup. We, you know, and that wasn't Moto America's intention. It was to try to get as many different brands as we can. And it just seems the last couple of years. You know, obviously we had KTM last year. We lost them, which was a shame. And then everybody jumped on the Cowie, even though Yamaha put a bunch of money and investments in the R three. Um, it, it it just never. It, it goes without saying that as racers, everybody finds a way to get on the best packages. And right now the Cowie has been. So hopefully that'll help uh, get the R3 back up there. All right, Greg, well, let's talk a little bit now about thousand super stock and what we've noticed, especially over the last three rounds, there's been one guy kind of doing what Rocco Landers is doing in the liquid Molly cup, but Andrew Lee wins by 7.6 seconds at arguably his home race, uh, Sonoma. Um, but pretty much, you know, since, Utah, he's been pretty dominant. They found something with the bike. He's just matured as a rider. I think uh, Andrew's done a good job defending national number one. He ends up beating Michael Gilbert by 7.6 seconds. Never really looked that close either, by the way. Uh, Andrew got down into the minute 37s in qualifying, uh, which nobody else did. Um, I just think that when you look at what he's doing and the race runs that he's putting together, he's making it look pretty easy. Jeff May ends up third in that race. Um, I, I, again, I've said it this year. We both have Stefano Mesa, amazing job ending up fourth. Most people would sit there and go, well, fourth, 17 seconds back. Yeah. But I don't know if Stefano had ever seen Sonoma before, uh, let alone having the limited amount of time that he did. I think it's the hardest track to learn, but this is a kid with a lot of experience, He ends up fourth to keep himself, you know, right there in the championship hunt. It's a little bit bigger now, but uh, that's his first time off the podium all year too for Mesa. You know, which is that's yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, first time off the podium, and he uh, what is he back now? Twenty three points. He's back twenty three points. Michael Gilbert. A little bit of a rebound race for Michael. He hasn't really been there. Uh, Obviously, struggled at Laguna. Struggled at Utah. Uh, we saw a DNF out of him in race one at road America. So this was a little bit of a rebound race for him. Good to see him end up second, but really the guy you got to talk about is Andrew Lee. Yeah. Andrew Lee is absolutely a stud. And I have to say, I think it was what the last podcast or something, Jason, when I, <laughs> yeah, he's getting a little motivation from you, didn't he? <laughs> all I said, was, I mean, of all people, Andrew, of all people, Andrew, yeah, don't listen to, get to, motivation don't listen from to me. Greg White. Don't listen you to are me. scraping the bottom of the yeah, barrel. Don't listen to me. But I said that I said that, <laughs> I didn't say he lacked explosive. Maybe I did, but what I, what I meant to say was he hasn't shown us explosive speed yet that he just showed us consistency and all that kind of stuff. And so he, he wins that race and yeah, you know, eight seconds, 7.6 seconds and sent me a text, that explosive speed enough for you. And I was like, all right, man, listen, Hey, get motivated. I don't really care. But the thing Jason about Andrew that I thought was really interesting was like, 
Well, I'll put it to you this way. I went to look on his website, right? AndrewLeeRacing.com because he posted something up on, on Facebook. And it said that he has a chance to become the first back-to-back Moto America champion, which actually, you know, thinking about it, I was like, hey, wait a second. Is that right? Maybe in stock thousand. I don't know. Because didn't Cam win 15, 16? Is that right? Don't yeah. know. But anyway, um, what it said at the end was before moving into Superbike full time. And I was like, <gasps> what are you talking about, man? You got a ride, you know? So you know what I did? I picked up the phone and I called him and I said, dude, you got a ride for next year? <laughs> yeah. So currently I don't have a cemented ride for 2020 yet, but Moto America called me and basically told me that uh, if I continue on the current path for the rest of the, this season, that I will not be eligible for the stock 1000 class for next year. So my options I think for next year would be super sport or super bike. And I'd obviously the premier class is always the goal. So I'm going to keep doing what I can do and hopefully land a ride for next season. So obviously Jay, we know that junior cup stock thousand class is designed to feed the classes up top. So those are, you know, part of the rules as we saw like Alex Dumas get bounced out after, you know, two strong seasons and a championship and junior cup and so on. But um, you know, what do you think about that, about his comments? Well, I think that um, there's a couple things I think about that. First off, he's more than capable. Uh, he's got a an incredible racing IQ. Um, probably one of the smartest kids that I ever had the pleasure to work with and ride with and talk to. When you talk about racing, it's very like, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but when you talk to Andrew, things are very well thought out. He Before he asks a question, it's a question that you could tell has been burning in his mind. So he wants to get an answer for it. And, um, he'll be a, he'd be an addition to any, any team that would be out there that would, that, that has knowledgeable people working, uh, with him. I think he would be an asset to them. The fact that he gets called to be moved up, I think is interesting in and of itself because we would not want to lose somebody like Andrew if he doesn't have a place to go right now. Again, it's kind of one of those things that we've been down the path before where we see guys that, He's able to go do this class, doesn't have as many races as some of the other classes. This was an affordable class for him to stay involved in, and it's one that him and his team took very seriously. And we've seen the 1,000 Superstock entry list grow exponentially this year. We've seen real names come out and start to race, race it. Uh, you know, We saw the additional Michael Gilbert. We saw Jeff May. We've seen Stefano Mesa. Um Miles Thornton, Carl, uh, Corey Alexander will be at the next, like I think, the last three rounds. So it's given these guys a place to come and race. And I would hate to lose Andrew because he doesn't have a place to race next year. If that was the case that said, I, I can only hope that he gets the, you know, a super bike program put together um, so that you can come and do it. The problem with getting a super bike program together is it's, it's so expensive and mm -hmm, that okay. would be the thing. It's just seeing that he has the money to be able to do it right. There's no, you know, for him, for Andrew, after you've gotten used to winning, there's no reason to come and do it with you know c grade equipment you want to make sure that you have the best stuff to be able to do it and that's just going to cost money yeah it definitely will and i think he's a little too tall for super sport i mean he can make it work you know if if that was the route he ended up going but i don't know just with the way he rides a stock thousand he's got it dialed in yep. i just want to see the kid on a super bike so when i called him after that thing jay I called him i was kind of frantic so i was like hey man sorry to come at you like that bro so let's backtrack a little bit new website you know the season's been going pretty good how about it? Yeah, so I had a uh, Michael Hill production or promotions and Gareth Bouch, I think that's how you pronounce his name. We came together and we're gonna launch up my new website, and I'm really excited to get that out on the air and kind of keep keep the avenue of media flowing and moving into hopefully getting the back to back championship this year. I mean, the Franklin Armory Graves Kawasaki Crews really put together a good program for me this year. I mean, we got off to a little bit of a rocky start after round one in Atlanta, came out and win, and uh, got a little hurt testing with Graves, come back, good a fourth. Uh, I think I got a third in race one at Road America, second in race two, then Utah, Laguna, and Sonoma go, go win the West Coast swing. So we're looking really good for the championship coming into pit race. So I'm uh, 
really trying to get geared up and go into Superbike for the next season. Hmm. I mean, I love hearing that. I did too. And you know what was funny, Greg, is when the accident happened when he tested, um, uh, Andrew must have hit me up within an hour after his accident. And it was basically like on my way to the hospital. And I was like, ugh, like what happened now? You know, I can't remember where I was, but I was. Did you say like, my, did you just Pridmore yourself? Yeah, no kidding. Did you, did you, did you, are you walking? Are you, like, <laughs> did you stub your toe? What'd you do? Right now, I, I knew it was a serious incident and I knew it was a serious accident. And the, the, the I, and I know I'm going to take grief for saying this, but I, I had an injury very similar to Andrew's at one time in my life. And, um, and I knew what he was going through and I, I knew the procedures that it was going to take. And you know what he said to me? He's like, Hey, I'm not worried if I miss VIR, if I miss it, he'd already done the workout in his brain. And if I can try to win this and win that and do this and that uh, it's sort of like even a week after the incident of his testing accident, he was pretty resigned to the fact that he was not going to VIR. He wasn't coming. And basically he ends up showing up. He ends up going there. And I told him that that fourth place finish was going to be so pivotal. And I mean, this was a kid that was going to not, not score any points and he got fourth. And I think that that gave him a big boost of confidence and he still wasn't completely healthy come road America. And he did okay there. Um, and then he showed what he could do on the West coast swing. He's the real deal. Andrew's really the real deal. And he finds ways of doing things. And I think that your burst of speed comments, <laughs> um, Andrew's the kind of guy where, if you watch him, he just does what he has to do to win. And at Sonoma, he he showed the guys that, hey, I've been around this place a few times and I know what's going on. And he did he did what he needed to do and won by, what, seven seconds? Yeah, and all you need is a hundredth of a thousandth of a second to win a race, that's right? right? I mean, that, that's all that's you right. need anyway. So it doesn't make a difference. So the thing about Andrew I like is he's one of the few people, Jay, that's brought outside industry sponsors in. I mean, mm -hmm. look, there's plenty of CBD oil and all that stuff going around, which obviously is kind of a hot debate topic. But Andrew has Franklin Armory, which is the title sponsor. And I was curious to find out, like, you know, how they have been with what they've been getting from Moto America and from Andrew this season. Yeah, it's, it's really cool having an out of industry sponsor like Franklin Armory come on board for us this season. It's a really good company. They're American made. And actually, the president used to uh, race old AMA. It just kind, kind of seemed like a, a good, good avenue for advertisement for him. And it seems every time we have a good conversation about how how the season's going, they're really positive with it. So I think moving forward that we could probably keep Franklin Armory, of course, coming into the season or uh, the series. But I think having Franklin come in also opens the door for maybe other riders and other out-of-industry teams that would uh, not – see it as an avenue prior. So I think this is kind of a good opening for uh, a lot of other companies and riders. Oh, that's great, Jay. But are you okay with him saying old AMA? <laughs> <laughs> old AMA. That, yeah, right. I, I, you know, the, the, the thing that you hope and you progress on is that we're, we count on, right now we're counting on riders to bring in sponsorship. And if you remember back in the day, there was, um, there was opportunities where if a company saw a, a competing company getting involved in something that they wanted to be involved as well, you know, he went out and got Franklin Armory and, and he's done a lot of his own homework. He's done a lot of things to try to put a best team and product together. And that's kind of what you have to hope, you, you know, all with, with, like you say, the CBD stuff, one person, one CBD company got involved at the beginning of the year. And now we've seen two or three others kind of follow. And, we need that. We need it bad. We need our industry to get a little bit of spike and in interest. And I think with the TV package and, and the paywall thing that we've had this year with, with Moto America, I think that there's been, our sport's been exposed a lot more, but I still feel like we're at its infancy with that. Like we're four years in, five years into Moto America now, but with just the new TV product this year, with the paywall product this year, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's starting over, but it's the first year of that. And I think that once the numbers shake out, which I hear are very good, it's going to give people like Andrew ammunition to go back to Franklin Armory. It's going to give him ammunition to go to other sponsors and say, look, Franklin Armory jumped on board with us for this. And this is what happened this year. Here's some numbers. We'd like to get your help as well. It gives him a chance to go get to some other companies as well. And also he could be in a position to educate other riders or team owners on how he got that sponsorship 
going through this process and saying, this is what they required from me. This is what they wanted. They wanted numbers. They wanted activation, whatever Franklin Armory is. And so that also can help permeate through the ranks and educate people on how do you approach sponsors and how do you satisfy what kind of return on investment they're looking for. So he could be a, a leader in that as well. And you can hear him say, you know, as far as writer promotion stuff, he's doing stuff with Michael Hill promotions. And I'm, I'm assuming that's our Michael Hill, correct? I don't know. I didn't even I'm sure him. it is. Yeah, it to Mike's, be, yeah. He's pretty on top of it. And, and, uh, and it, and I know that they've done some interviews together. So it'll be interesting to talk to Michael. He'll be at Pittsburgh as well. So we'll get to talk to him a little bit about some of that, but you know, the fact that you got a guy like him, who's wanting to also help these guys, maybe increase their visibility a little bit and promote themselves and do the things that are necessary to, to expose the brand of Moto America more, I think is, is great. So, and, and I, and I'd love to see Andrew, you know, I'd love to see him on a super bike. Uh, if that opportunity, if it, if it comes true, you know, now looking at it, Greg, he's talking about trying to win back to back championships. I think that let's not forget the next round at Pittsburgh is a double round for these guys. And, I think that this will be – this is just my opinion. I think Stefano Mesa has done what he's had to do to this point. And even speaking with Andrew uh, and Michael and all the other guys in this class, when you look at what's going on right now, Stefano's been to these next three races. He's been there a lot. He's been to Barber. Uh, that's a track that that he obviously knows very well. Been to Jersey. Uh, he's been to uh, to been to Pittsburgh. Saw him win last year in the support race there uh, with I think it was Weira last year. So twenty three points can evaporate quick. Yeah, so we're no going to really s- that it's right. And I think that after this round at Pittsburgh, it'll be time to take a true evaluation of this championship because it's right now it's kind of a two horse race. Um, Michael Gilbert is fifty one points back, so he's already over two races back. Uh, but I think that after this next round at Pittsburgh, this double round we have coming up, we'll have a lot clearer picture of, of what the last two rounds are going to look like in thousand Superstock. but it's been a lot more fun to watch this year. We've seen a lot of guys, a lot of different people on the podium as well. Um, and, uh, let's, let, real quick, did you, I don't know if you got to talk to him at all, but we saw Ashton Yates move up to, from, you know, 600 super sport Ashton's now riding, for Vic Fasola Racing, he's riding that Yamaha R1. He ended up seventh after showing some speed and qualifying and stuff. Did he you get did, did you yep. get to watch him at all? I didn't get to watch him, no, not at all. Mm-mm. Dude, he is a dad throwback. Is he really? Oh rides, my god. Rides just like his pops. Oh yeah. You go out and you watch Ashton, and there are so many similarities between him and his father on the racetrack watching them. I was out watching the sessions, obviously, and I was, I gotta be honest with you. I was giggling a little bit because the kid has so much bike control and his dad is, I, I mean, honestly, Aaron, Aaron had more uh, bike control than a lot of people that I ever saw. The things he was capable of doing on a bike were just insane to me. Uh, I've said that before on this show. Um, and yeah, Apple didn't fall far from the tree on this one. So it's cool <laughs> to see Ashton. It's cool to see Ashton jump up to a thousand now as well. It is. Well, you talked about a two horse race in that one. But it's a three-horse race in Twins Cup, Jason. As Drake Beecham is one point ahead of Alex Dumas, who's one point ahead of Michael Barnes. In the race, it was Dumas who won by 12 seconds over Beecham. And unfortunately for Michael Barnes, he had a DNF while leading the race. Uh, Joe Blasius in third. Chris Turner, Jason Madama. Our number one plate, Chris Parrish, had a bad, like a bad, like not horrible, like hurting, but bad, like unfortunate and ripped his bodywork apart crash. Uh, good race. I thought for, you know, up front until Michael's bike broke, tell us you, you saw more of the race. I was kind of half paying attention as we were doing some stuff, but I know you watched it close. Yeah. Because after the, after you and I get off the air, there's still a lot of things going on TV wise. And it's great. Cause you know, you, you're dealing with a lot of things there and, and what we've got to do next. And, um, I'm able to watch the super sport thousand or super stock thousand and the, and the twins cup. Yeah. You know, I feel bad for Barney because, he has always been that guy that's proven capable. I mean, I'm talking, uh, Greg, he was doing nationals. Barney was doing nationals two or three years prior to me doing my first one. So I want to say that when you think about it, I can't think of anybody, not one person in the history of our sport that 
is more durable than him in the sense that he's been around for, I want to say he's been around for almost 25, 30 years, like racing at a high level. Um, yeah, it's and, more than half his life. No yeah, because yeah, no, I I think I think it was eighty nine, which would make it thirty years ago. He was, and and you know he'll kill us if I'm wrong. I'm sure, but I think he was doing right. I think he was doing uh, AMA stuff eighty nine ninety um, on six hundreds and things. Um, but I felt bad for him because it wasn't like the bike just kind of broke and he wasn't doing anything special. He was, he was leading the race. He had a lap time that was a half a second quicker than the next. I mean, he was really proven himself to be the guy to beat that day. Um, and, and Alex Dumas had made a small mistake and the gap kind of got bigger and Alex just started to chip away at that lead again. And then we saw Barney's bike, um, uh, break, obviously a lot of smoke and things. And he pulled off in turn one, but it did make the championship a lot more interesting. Twins Cup now, three riders all separated by what three, you said three points, Greg? Two one points. Point. One, well, one one to two, yeah. Yeah, it's one. Two and points one, between so. three riders. Yeah. Um and I think that, you know, we saw Joe Blacious get his first podium that he's ever seen um on the Auto Best Suzuki. I mean, when you when you start to look at things, Drake Beecham did a tremendous job. He's our points leader. He ends up second up there, rode really well to do it, but you know, Alex ended up pretty much once Barney tipped off, it was a, it was pretty processional. Alex ends up winning the race by 12 and a half seconds. It's a young man. That's just only going to continue to get stronger and better as he goes. Um, and I think I made a mistake earlier because I think the final double header for super stock thousands at Barber, the final double header for twins cup, Greg is actually this weekend. Isn't it? Oh, I think twins. Yeah. yeah I think I mixed those up. Yeah, that might so, be. I haven't looked at the schedule yet, actually, Jay. But yep, yeah, you're probably I think right. it's my my fault on that one. So I think that the Twins Cup actually does a double this weekend, and the thousand right. goes yep. to Barber. The, yep. is, is the thousand superstar? Yeah, twins, so my mistake. Twins Cup uh, wraps us up both Saturday and Sunday. Yep. So they get they get a double header, um, and I think that that man again, all these points up for grabs. Who's going to take the bull by the horns and and show that they could do it? And when you look at the points battle right now. Barney's won races. Drake's won a race. Um, and, and Alex won a race. Alex and Barney are the two guys that are consistently kind of pushing the, the, the pace. They're the ones up front. The biggest fear I have for Drake right now, not a fear as much as it's the, the one thing I could think of is he kind of is always in that battle for that third, fourth, second battle, you know, um, like in this case, Blaise just ends up right behind him, less than a second behind him. Um, so, so it's going to be a matter of you, there's got to be some separation. Like we got to be able to see some guys push the pace and get further up. Alex Dumas went forty three one this race. Barney went forty two six. Fastest lap for Drake was a forty four zero. So there's a little bit of a a gap there that Drake is going to continue to to chip away at. But that's what it's going to take. It's going to take him beating Alex or Barney on any given weekend. Straight up, heads up. That's what it's going to take. All right, Jason. Question for you. Yep. About Twins Cup. How many? Remember back in the day when we raced, we had a 44 rider max at most tracks. Some of the smaller tracks we would go to, it would be 40 rider max. Okay. And yep. I, I actually don't know because we, I don't think we've been in this position before as of at the moment, what the max is for Moto America on a grid. Do you? Because back in the day, remember Jay, it was it was four riders across, so we just have eleven yeah. rows. Now we're only three. So I mean, Correct. It, the reason I asked this is because at the moment, this was as of four days ago. Okay, the entries for twins is forty one entries for twins. Forty one. Wow. So yeah. if it's forty, even if everyone made it on the qualifying time, one person's got to go home. And it has been a while since we've had any situations like that. I yeah. know when I first started racing in nineteen ninety seven. I got sent home at Phoenix because I was the 45th qualifier in both 750 Supersport and 600. Can and you so that, that was it. Can you repeat that? Well, there was a whole stack of... I mean, I can go into the story if you want. I was on pit lane. <laughs> we, we had no pit lane speed, we don't need to speed hear limits back then. Uh, right. You were allowed to do wheelies on Great. pit lane. And I and I was standing yeah. there and this dude wheelied and hit me from behind and I went flying up. Like there was a... You know. Yeah. yeah uh, eh. Anyway, All the right. point was I Great. wasn't... The, that, that wasn't the only guy who got bumped out. Okay. There was a stack of people, at least there's at people least two or me. three more behind you, at least 45 or 60, or maybe almost a hundred people behind me. I believe, I mean, you know, I'm getting old. My memory could be a little fuzzy, but no, yeah. say it's not yeah. so. 
But I'm going to keep an eye on that because I don't know if there yeah, is there's a, max. a lot of people. It's going to be a matter of being able to do the pace because, you know, Barney and Dumas and, and Beecham and those guys, they're going to be setting the pace. Yeah, they're um, set the pace is set the bubble for, you know, percentage of qualifying and who's going to make it. It's, so. Yeah. But dude, did you, that race, though, that battle for second when uh, after Barney, like his bike broke and Alex was kind of out front, the battle for second between Chris Parrish and Beecham and and uh, and Chris Turner was pretty intense. So I was bummed to see Chris Parrish crash too, because he's our defending champ and would have been great to see him, you know, get up on the podium. But his crash was like, it was so big because he, he was going around the carousel carrying a ton of speed <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then, you know, and slipped off. But, but, uh, but there's, there's some hungry guys that are still trying to get up there. So, you know, any, on any given weekend, I think Chris Turner, Chris Parrish, uh, they, they could be guys, Joe Blacious could be guys that can upset the apple cart too and get in there. But the pace at Pittsburgh will be interesting, right? Because because it is a double round, man. You got to get up to up, up to pace pretty quickly there, so you can make the cutoff. Because those guys are going to be the ones setting the pace of what qualifying is going to actually be. And you can catch a one and a half hour superbike show on FS2, Fox Sports 2, 5:30 p.m. East on Saturday, and then after World Surf League, that action happens at 9:30 p.m. East on Sunday. Other races, practices, qualifying, plus a ton of other content are available at Moto America Live Plus. That's the app, okay? Now, listen to me, people. Just get the app and pay for it because all the races we've had so far, all the qualifyings, all that stuff is video on demand. Winter is right around the corner. I hate to say that, right? Like fall's coming, but... God, I can't believe it. Yeah. I know. Get the Moto America Live Plus app. You can also check out on NBCSN, uh, the Inside Moto America show, a cool behind-the-scenes show that's hosted by our very own rock star, Miss Hannah Lopa. Please share this podcast with all of your racing fans. And don't forget, at every single event, Jason will sign autographs if you approach him. But don't ask him to walk over to you, okay? Because, <laughs> yeah, oh, wait, could... what, what hands hurt? Yeah. So, yeah, just yeah. come over to him and ask. And then he can always put a Sharpie in his teeth and maybe sign yeah, it that I'll way. I'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I've given it. I don't think I've signed an autograph in about 10 years. Like, <laughs> honestly, no. Oh. Hey, got to shout out, make a quick shout out to my counterpart here, G Dub. Wins his first U.S. Uh, Archery National Championship and then comes back and does the double two days in a row. Greg, I know archery is a big deal for you and from all your loyal fans out there, your biggest one here. Dude, congrats because I know you've been working really hard at your archery and it's pretty cool to see you uh, all of a sudden win something like, you know, legitimately. Like there was more, there was, <laughs> there was more than just G-Dub before all the jokes come in. Yeah. There, or did you pay guys to stand next to you on the podium? No, you didn't pay those no, guys, right? No, I did not. No. It, should there, I be hitting was... you? Should G Dub? I, I like. This is going to be good. I'm putting you on the spot now. But should I hit you up for a little loan right now? Winning both those. <laughs> it was. Should I hit uh, you up for a little loan? <laughs> listen, man. I played. I played like racers do. I played the contingency <laughs> game. I ended up buying a new bow that I pays know. out good contingency. And yeah, yep. it was. Um, it was. Uh, I, I think I don't know, Jay. Like two thousand. Like I'm legitimately saying, I think it's two thousand percent more than I've earned so far in in all the archery I've done in three years or four years, and but all no, the racing was, you ever did. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was it was uh, <laughs> it was it was unexpected. It was surprising. It was uh, it was cool, and I yeah. hope I get to experience it again. But if I don't, I'm gonna hold on to those those two gold medals for sure. It was uh, it was a lot of fun, and interestingly enough, I do commentate a lot of archery, Jason, and. Yep. The archery community kind of like in a weird way, like they demand like they're they don't really know that a play by play announcer is just supposed to be like anybody. It's the color commentator. That's the man, you know. And mm -hmm. so archery, it was amazing how many people reached out and were like, hey, man, I didn't even know you shot. And I'm like, yeah, I know when I'm doing certain types of archery called 3D and I commentate, I don't get to shoot, but I do love the sport. And that's why I got, you know, got into commentating that as well. So thanks, Jay. I appreciate it. It was no, uh, it's great, dude. Super pumped yeah. for you. We'll talk more about it when I get to see you. But everybody, if, if you can't watch the stuff, come on out, you know, to pit race. It's beautiful race facility. We, you know, we we have practice and everything Friday starting at nine o'clock in the morning. Saturdays, bikes are on track at eight o'clock. Racing's going to conclude at about five. Saturday and Sunday, you get very similar programs. You get a junior cup race. You get a super sport race, a super bike race, twins cup. And on Sunday, you're treated to a stock thousand in addition. So come on out and visit us. At the Championship of Pittsburgh, it's Moto America, Superbike Racing, the EBC Brake Superbike Class is the premier class. That goes off at 3 o'clock local time both days. So come on out and uh, get an autograph from Jason. Anything you'd like to say on the way out there, guy? No, nah, looking forward to seeing everybody in Pittsburgh. Safe travel. See you there, G-Dub.